It's that time of the year. Your vacation is coming up. You can already hear the beach waves, feel the warm breeze, relax, and think about work. You really, really want it all to work out while you're away. Monday.com gives you and the team that peace of mind. When all work is on one platform and everyone's in sync, things just flow. Wherever you are, tap the banner to go to Monday.com. Your grip grows ever tighter as your body is violently jerked around. The ground underneath rushes by, a cloud of dirt being kicked up behind you. Even your teeth clack together as you are hoisted and dropped over and over. The trees are nothing but a blur. You can only focus ahead, helpless. The skin of your thighs rubs raw, and your pelvis takes the brunt of the assault. Every small hill feeling like dropping off a cliff. The short dark mane of the horse you're straddled on feels as though it's made of bristles. Each time your hands shift on the reins, the stiff hair digs into your skin. Why did you get on this horse? How long have you been on it? Questions buzz through your head, and the horse turns to look at you, still maintaining its stride. Its bright golden eyes press one question in your mind over any other. Where is it taking me? Welcome to Freaky Folklore, the podcast where we discover the horrifying legends across the world and tell terrifying tales of monsters both ancient and modern. This week we are going over the bearer of fortune and mischief, an English trickster known as the Irish Puka. This show is part of the EerieCast Podcast Network. Find more terrifying tales at EerieCast.com and be sure to follow us on Spotify or your favorite podcasting service. You can leave an honest review on iTunes, too. The more we get, the more we grow, and hopefully, the more monsters we can explore. If you would like to submit an encounter or suggestions for future episodes, you can email them to carmencarrion at gmail.com. That is C-A-R-M-A-N-C-A-R-R-I-O-N at gmail.com. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram for information on future episodes. Oh, come on! Muriel cursed. Her leg swung out and struck the side of the car's tire. What is wrong with you? She continued to scream at the vehicle, her words deeply steeped in frustration. Grunts and moans practically carried her around the car the same one she had already walked around dozens of times, hoping to see something new on each pass. Another grunt brought her to the ground. Palms placed on the fine gravel road, she lowered her head and peered under the car. A lackadaisical expression enveloped her face, emotions shifting like wildfire, from frustration to apathy and back again. You can't be doing this to me, Martha. She observed, that indeed nothing was leaking from the underside of the car, not even the faint smell of gasoline wafted through the chilled air. Satisfied that the issue wasn't emitting from the undercarriage, she rose to her feet, wiping the grime from her palms onto the fabric of her jeans. And although she had already done it twice before, she made her way to the front of the car and lifted the hood. The last two times she looked at Martha's inner workings, she was able to see the heat coming off the engine as it warped the air. This time, however, the engine had grown cold. I have no idea what I'm looking at here. She was malignant, suddenly cursing herself for not paying more attention when she watched her mother fix the thing before. Still, she stared, trying to see if anything obvious was out of place. There was nothing of note, though. That's how the whole vehicle was. Nothing seemed out of sorts. The check engine light hadn't even come on to warn her that the car would stall. Reaching into her pocket, Muriel pulled out her cell phone and peered at the illuminated screen. Of course, she thought. Surrounded by tall, lush trees, in virtually the middle of nowhere. And of course, she wouldn't have service. Even when she tried to stand on top of Martha and reach her arms to the sky, not so much as one bar appeared. 
Head swiveling, she looked up and down the road, the long stretch of it. On either side was just a long gravel road, the kind you can hear shifting under the weight of your car, the kind that every so often causes a pebble to reach up and smack your fender. Someone else has to come this way, she said to herself, not believing her forked tongue lies. She stepped to the side of the road and took a seat on the vibrant green foliage reaching out from the forest. God, Muriel, what are you doing? Words that taunted no one but herself. She mindlessly scrolled through text messages, knowing well and good no new ones were coming out. She reread the conversation with her dad. I can fix up a gunshot wound, no problem. A car, though? That's beyond me, huh, Dad? She had mentioned being burned out and that all her work in the ER was starting to wear her down. She was doubting if she had made a difference. Of course she had, though. Lives were saved. But was she doing something that other people at the hospital couldn't do? Looking to the side of her, she noticed a bushel of green, and on it were small dark spots. Berries littered the plant. Reaching over, she grabbed one. A blackberry rested between pointer and thumb. As it twisted in her hands, the structure gave way and spilled a dark blue liquid down the palm of her hand. Well, these are no good. Her eyes fixated on the liquid dripping onto the grass. The overripe berry was all but obliterated in her grasp. Good idea, Dad. Focus returning to her text. She read over her father's suggestion to take a trip to Ireland and returned to their roots for some clarity and purpose. It was initially a welcome vacation, as she hadn't taken one in, well, ever. Though it felt less so sitting here on the side of the road, waiting for the population of no one to come and save her. The scrolling went too far back, however, and her eyes glazed over a text she had sent to her dad. I should have been there. I could have saved her. She felt a pain in her chest, that she had felt a hundred times before. The phone's screen turned off and she was left with only the image of herself sitting in the black rectangle. Looking up from her phone, the tightness still resting on her chest, once again the surroundings were observed. When she took herself away from the urgency, it was quite beautiful. Long, clean lines of trees reached out into the road, a comforting gray sky that offered shade from the sun, and a beautiful horse. A horse? Muriel's mind shouted. Sure enough, in the middle of the road stood a horse, large and dark. It was like a painting, a lone sleek horse with the rolling Ireland landscape behind it, the ever so faint wisp of fog rolling around it. Hello, Muriel chimed. She had loved horses as a kid and was lucky enough to ride them regularly as a teen. It was only when she started college that she had to forfeit the time spent heading to the ranch. It was a majestic beast, no doubt. Standing proud, it was easily one of the largest that she had ever seen. Its short and shiny black fur was without imperfections, no smudge of dirt or grime on it. Where did you come from? Muriel asked, standing up nice and slow, trying not to move too suddenly. The horse threw its head back and huffed, almost as if it was replying to her. There was, however, a harness on the behemoth of a horse. You a little lost too, fella? She could feel her heart softening with every word spilling out. Cautious, she took a step forward and watched the horse's reaction. Oh, she exclaimed, almost too loud, before moving to her car. Leaning inside, she rummaged through some papers. GPS was touch and go in rural areas sometimes, so she made sure to print out some maps. Don't go anywhere. She spoke again to the horse, who was steadfast in place. It took a minute to find the right map. With paper in hand, her eyes scanned the road she was approximately on. Fingers traced the road lines to the nearest sign of civilization. McMahon Farms, she touted. That sounds fake. She laughed, imagining an alien getting asked what their name is. Me? Oh, yes, I'm, um... Door still open, she exited the vehicle and gently closed it behind her. 
I'm a er, human, McMahon. She pitched her voice up, mockingly trying to sound like someone who had just landed on the planet. She stared the horse down for a moment, making sure to avoid direct eye contact. All right, let us see where you're from, fella. Lifting her arm, she reached out a palm as she approached the horse. Small, soothing steps carried Muriel toward the horse. It didn't buck, nor neigh as the gap between them was closed. Each step revealed just how large the horse was. If it was wild, she wouldn't approach it, but it had a riding harness on, so she thought just maybe. The heat coming off the horse reminded Muriel of the waves of hot air that she witnessed her engine giving off. Once close enough, she was able to spot a small plague of bronze that had been fixed to the harness. The light brown metal gleamed under a hidden sun, eyes squint so close to the horse she could almost hear its heartbeat. Property of McMahon Farms. She nearly squealed. Her plan wasn't perfect, far from it. Regardless, it beats sitting around, hoping for something to happen. Okay, big guy, take it easy. Reaching out, she carefully and ever so slowly pressed a palm against its silky fur. It felt unreal, like a curtain of velvet. The beast's heartbeat could be felt shaking its whole body, but it was rhythmic and lacked any sense of unease. Muriel's heart was the one about to leap through a ribcage. Slow and steady, she whispered soft words that dripped between her lips like honey as she grabbed one of the reins and pulled down on it. Just enough force that the horse could feel it, but not enough to make the horse feel imposed upon. The horse stood strong for a moment, not relenting to her commands. Standing with her hand on the horse, she was able to grab the full scope of how large it was. She could imagine this horse leading an infantry charge into battle. She hadn't mounted a horse in so long. She needed to guide him over to her so that she could begin mounting the steed. But when she tugged the reins, he didn't budge. I don't like being told what to do either, she retorted. Releasing her grip, steps were taken to establish distance between them. Muriel looked back at the car, trying to remember if she had a footstool or something in the trunk. She started to walk away from the horse when she heard it huff. It was strange. It almost sounded like a word like the horse spoke to draw her attention, a mixing of mutters underneath the typical horse neigh. It was enough to pull attention, though, and suddenly it felt to Muriel like she was the one whose reins were being tugged. When she turned around, her heart fluttered to see that the steed was sitting. What? The word wasn't meant to come out, but she was bewildered enough that her thoughts slipped. Not only that, but the horse was looking directly at her. And unintentionally, they met a gaze, and with eye contact, the horse threw its head back. Felt like it was saying, get on. Who was Muriel to quite literally look a gifted horse in the mouth? As she felt invited, her steps were less cautious. Nearly giddy for a moment, she forgot about the predicament she was in. The childlike wonder she felt when she approached the bowed horse again could have washed away any sense of dread. Again, fingers laced around the brown leather reins. Her legs swung over, and with another hand on the saddle, she hoisted herself over the horse. Lou Boo would have loved you, big guy. She mentioned, shifting herself into position on the saddle. It felt so snug, almost as if it was always hers. With both hands now on the reins, and before she could give a command, the horse rose. It felt like going through bunny hills on a roller coaster, Muriel's stomach being left behind as she was lifted. Okay, let's go to your place. She pressed the heel of her shoe into the rib of the horse, and a quaint jaunt began. She could feel her lips turning up. A horse that big, even slow strides would get them to the farm faster than Muriel sprinting her hardest. As she got comfortable with the speed, the horse would pick things up. Like it was shifting gears, it would go faster and faster. 
Muriel could feel the cool Irish air press her cheeks. She watched the road ahead, content. The horse turned to look back as they were running. She made eye contact again. The horse's eyes were so gold. A dragon's hoarded treasure seemed to swim in his head. She swore she saw patterns and lines dance around in bright shimmering eyes, a gaze that stuck out all the more against midnight fur. And as they rode in tandem, Muriel felt a heaviness. That feeling she had in her stomach never left, that sinking sensation. The world around her started to mix in with her peripheral vision of the steed's fur. It got darker and darker, but the sky itself still remained the same inviting gray. The more they went down the road and the faster they went down it, the darker things seemed to get. Every time she swallowed, the saliva felt thicker. Every time she tried to breathe, the air was heavier. She could feel something shifting. Each clack of the horse's hooves on the ground stripped away at that childlike wonder that had blinded her. She knew they were going the right way. If they stayed on the road, they'd be fine. Looking down, the mixture of gravel was now a flat sheet of one color rushing beneath them. The horse's height made his movement quick. It didn't feel like it was going full stride yet, but it was already faster than anything she had ridden before. And with its height, if she tried to jump off, there's no telling what injury might occur. Any semblance of comfort she held on to faded away when her vision lifted and she looked out into the tree line, once lush and green, now more similar to the sky above, imposing trees that threatened to smack her off the horse. More than that, though, more than anything else, the fear in her heart spread like a virus when she saw what was beyond the trees. They looked like fireflies at first, but with her vision tunneling in, she could see they were eyes much like the horse she was on, countless sets of bright golden eyes belonging to creatures she had never seen before, watching them riding along the road. Muriel felt well and truly trapped, completely at the mercy of the horse she was fixed atop. This episode is sponsored by June's Journey. Attention all mystery lovers. Dive into the captivating world of June's Journey, the hidden object game that will awaken your inner detective. Join June Parker on her quest to uncover the shocking truth behind her sister's murder in the glamorous 1920s. I'm a couple of chapters in, and I love unlocking new pieces to the mystery after each hidden item search. The beautifully detailed scenes, from New York's finest parlors to the charming sidewalks of Paris, make the experience truly immersive. As you progress, you'll also get to build and customize your very own island estate, complete with stunning gardens and luxurious buildings. Gather compelling evidence, decipher cleverly hidden clues, and unravel the dark secrets of the Parker family. Each twist and turn will keep you on the edge of your seat eager to crack the case. Cooperate or compete against other players in the detective club, and you'll even get a chance to play in a detective league to test your skills. Are you ready to jump back in time, detectives? Download June's Journey for free today in iOS and Android. For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture, and the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Stories of the Irish puka seem to originate from the Celtic, English, and Channel Islands. The word puka and all the variations of its spelling is the Old English word for goblin. The word itself is thought to have originated as far back as the 8th century, Primitive Irish language. Though the letter P didn't exist in Primitive English, and so it's thought the word comes from a cultural connection between the Primitive Irish and Celtics. 
It, like many other supernatural folklore, is told to be a creature of both benevolence and mischief. These spirits can bring good and bad fortune to the rural communities they center around. The puka is a creature that can be hard to track down, as it is often spoken of as having shape-shifting capabilities, seen as a wide variety of different local animals, taking the forms of small mammals to larger animals. Even stated to be able to take the shape of a human, though while doing so the observer may notice that the puka's human shape still retains traits associated with other animals, like the ears of a cat or the tail of a horse. Unlike many other creatures of folklore, the Irish puka seems uncharacteristically open about its identity, able to communicate and explain its existence to those that come across it, especially when taking a human form. The puka appears most commonly as it does within our story today, though. A large horse with sleek black hair and a flowing mane, and piercing golden eyes. The puka will often, given its trickster-like nature, try to entice those less aware of the folklore onto its back, though it most commonly can accomplish this task with those that might have spent a bit too much time hitting the bottom of bottles. Once an individual is tricked onto the horse's back, it is said to take them for the most wild ride they'll ever go on. The Irish puka will run as fast as it can with the victim on its back, speeding through its surroundings with reckless abandon, whether the horse is running through trees that will cause branches to smack against the rider, or around rough terrain when it can leap and bound to jostle the rider's body like a rag doll. Some believe that this behavior is what earned the belief that the puka is potentially dangerous to farmers when residing near them. A wild ride might send the puka through crops and over fences trampling everything in its way. Though the rider is always dropped off where they were picked up, without a scratch on them, which is more than can be said for some other mythological creatures. Though stories of these wild rides appear all over Northern Europe, it's the Irish in particular that has come up with measures of defense against the puka's tricks. As it is said, if someone carries around spurs with them and uses them when on a puka's back, they may take control of the puka until being kicked off. An old Irish puka tale told by Sean O'Cronin regales such an instance. The story is about an Irish boy who had already fallen victim to a puka and was prepared for the next time he was to face one. The story goes. The farmer asked the lad what had kept him out so late. The lad told him. I have spurs, said the farmer. Put them on you tonight. And if he brings you, give him the spurs. And this the lad did. The thing threw him from its back, and the lad got back early enough. Within a week, the puka was before him again, after housing the cows. Come to me, said the lad, so I can get up on your back. Have you the sharp things on? said the animal. Certainly, said the lad. Oh, I won't go near you then, he said. In stories where the rider is fortunate enough to be sporting spurs with them, the puka will always refer to them as sharp things. It's an old Irish belief that cold steel was a material that could be used to ward off supernatural beings. But pukas, as mischievous as they can be, don't always come with the intention to get one over on their victim. They can be helpful to farmers, and similar to tales of the Mothman, can sometimes appear as almost an omen for events that might unfold. One such tale of kindness comes from the Irish poet Lady Wilde. A farmer's son named Podrick one day noticed the invisible presence of the puka brushing by and called out to him, offering a coat. The puka appeared in the guise of a young bull and told him to come to the old mill at night. From that time onward, the puka came secretly at night and performed all the work of milling the sacks of corn into flour. Podrick fell asleep the first time, but later concealed himself in a chest to catch sight of them, and later made a present of a fine silk suit. This unexpectedly caused the puka to go off to see a little of the world and cease its work. But by then, the farmer's wealth allowed him to retire and educate his son. Later, at Podrick's wedding, the puka left a gift of a golden cup filled with a drink that evidently ensured their happiness. 
There are even Irish agricultural traditions that suggest a symbiotic relationship between farms and the puka. It's associated with Samhain, a goedelic harvest festival, when the last of the crops are brought in. Anything remaining in the fields is considered puka, or fairy blasted, and hence inedible. In some locales, reapers leave a small share of the crop, the puka's share, to appease the hungry creature. November 1st marks the end of the harvest season and is the one day when puka are expected to behave civilly. It's also said, perhaps owing to the duality of puka's legend, that they will spit on berries and crops, which render them inedible. Further still, there are tales of caution around consuming overripe blackberries. As it is said, the puka will be able to enter anyone who does as such. Surprisingly, the puka is said to have the capability to be quite chatty under the right conditions. Willing to shoot the breeze, like any good Irishman. Willing to give handy advice and potential prophecies. Houses in some rural areas will sport a bench on the right side of their door. The post for the fence of the house will vary. On the right of the post will be smooth and clean, while on the left it will be worn, if there's a post at all. As it's believed, a good puka will sit on the right, and a bad one will sit on the left. The puka will often open with lines about how it used to live in the house, or they'll ask how long the homeowners have been there, often wanting to talk about how the family had lost its fortune, or had come upon hard times. And while the creature is perfectly pleasant, it will leave the conversation and the home without so much as a warning or words of parting talking about giving them the old Irish goodbye, eh? Even outside of its country of origin, the puka's influence has reached into media spanning the globe. The puka and its varied spellings have wriggled their way into many pieces of literature throughout the ages. In A Midsummer Night's Dream by Shakespeare, a character is nicknamed Sweet Puck, P-U-C-K, being another spelling of the puka. From novels to Disney movies and children's storybooks, the puka and all its shape-shifting glory lumber through, appearing as horses or cats and sometimes being a part of a character's heritage. Due to the shape-shifting nature and supernatural presence, that puka applies to just about any media the creator sees fit. Even in Western media, manga, like most famously Berserk, a character that goes by the name of Puck is later revealed to be a nature spirit, just as the Irish believe the puka to be. From video games that use variations of the puka's name like Dig Dug and The Witcher 3 for enemies, to television shows like Into the Dark and Legends of Tomorrow that feature the creature's appearance, the supernatural influence of the puka is ever-present. The looming and shifting shapes are ready to play with any character that dares to face them. Despite its dense lore and notoriety, officially documented sightings beyond hearsay of local folks are far and few between. But stories told and believed encounters with the creature are enough to keep its story alive. Like this tale, where Irish author Padraig O'Farrell, 1932-2004, narrates this story which was inspired by the written account of an anonymous Kildare man. The terrain was difficult, and the fox ran fast, so that near Lithy, only one of the members of the hunt, a man named Grennan, and horse, who was really Puka, remained with the pack. The gorge was in full spate, but hounds were gaining on their quarry, and started to pick their way across rocks. Seeing the danger, Grennan attempted to recall hounds, but Puka ahead of them was tempting them onwards. The fox headed for a ledge on a narrow part of the gorge. Then, seeing Puka's red eyes spitting fire, the fox jumped. It missed the ledge, falling into turbulent waters below. The Puka easily leaped across the gorge, disappearing into the woodlands. But pack of hounds hard on the scent of fox went headlong into the pool. Looking down, Grinnan saw fox and hounds trying desperately to swim to safety through swirling swell. 
Other hounds dashed against rocks were yelping in pain and dying. He wept as most of the pack went under. Suddenly his sorrow gave way to terror. He heard a diabolical neighing, like an animal laughing, from the woods opposite. Grinna knew, then, it was a puka. This story takes place in a valley now converted into a hydroelectric power station. Between 1938 and 1940, 76 houses were demolished, and bridges, at Humphreystown, Balt Boys, and Burgage, were blown up before the entire valley was flooded for the hydroelectric power station. A Protestant church, St. Mark's, built in 1682, was also submerged. To this day, there have been many claims of people hearing bells tolling beneath the waters of lakes. From wild rides to agricultural beliefs, the puka has carved its name into the landscape of Northern Europe. Muriel watched in horror as the trees whipped by, the eyes watching her from the forest grow brighter. It looked like a search party bearing flashlights was exiting the woods. Her heart beat in time with the clacking of the horse's hooves a sound that started to pound in her ears like distant war drums. She was stuck. Even if she could roll off, she didn't know the intentions of the creatures watching her. Various animals, bunnies and foxes, all with black fur and golden eyes. Muriel swore she even saw people staring out. She didn't understand how fast they were moving and how she was able to make any features out. They should have been messy streaks of black fur and gray in her vision. Instead, the figures stood out, picturesque in their appearance. The wind going by her ears started to sound like music, or maybe someone singing. Something like a lullaby, low and smooth. Like something was trying to tell her it would be okay. She couldn't shake the fear. The horse only picked up speed unkind to her worries. It was in what she only assumed was a full sprint now. Its feet pounded hard on the gravel, kicking up clouds of dust. Muriel looked behind to get a scope of how far they had gone. It looked like the world was melting away. External tunnel vision. Despite it being the middle of the day, midnight was hot on their heels. Chased by an onyx sky, A horrible fate closing in on them. She wondered if the horse was running to something or away. She had to take control, not of the horse, but herself. She took a few quick shallow breaths, embracing the frantic nature. Turning away from the midnight, she lowered her frame, creating a more aerodynamic frame. Fingers gripped tight on the reins as she watched ahead, Come on, boy, she muttered. She could almost feel her mother's chest under her palms, the fabric of her blouse. Come on, Mom, please. Words slipped through gritted teeth. As her resolve stilled itself, as the horrors around her clambered on, she thought about open-heart surgery, something she practiced over and over again, something that was second nature to her now something that would look horrifying to someone doing it for the first time. That's just the nature of things, though, isn't it? Anything can be scary if it's the first time you encounter it. The eyes that watched them were just a soft glow from the woods, like drifting lanterns. The horse was confident and strong, easily bounding over a few branches that had found their way into the road. Then suddenly, the horse jerked to the right, and into the woods. Muriel's body was tossed left and right as the horse bounded through the trees and thrashed over shrubbery. The various creatures were so close, some of them reaching out as if trying to grab the pair. Even her stilled resolve was concerned with their intentions. A few branches would lash out, slipping across her cheeks and arms, small cuts splitting over shallow skin. Each one made her worry that one of the forest dwellers was going to pull her from the horse. The woods were darker than the road. She could feel that creeping empty behind them getting closer. 
like the physical manifestation of an omen. Reach out, long, desolate hands, and just as she was positive, they had reached her. They cleared the woods and jettisoned onto another dirt path. She could see it, a small farmhouse closing in. The horse jumped the fence, nearly sending Muriel off of its back. Once, finally reaching the front of the farm, the horse trotted from its breakneck pace into a gentle trot, into a stationary position. The horse again lowered its stance to allow Muriel to jump off. It felt weird getting down like she was meant to pretend everything didn't just happen. With a few steps between them, the horse rose and trotted in circles, displaying a sort of urgency still. It was quiet. The wind's soft whistle was barely audible. Something more than her perilous journey felt off. She quickly walked up the steps, making note of the old bench sitting by the door. She looked at the horse, who again reeled its head back. The soft wind pushed the door of the farmhouse open, and immediately Muriel saw her, a woman laying on her back on the floor. Oh God! Her voice chimed out, and she pushed the door open, rushing inside to kneel by the elderly woman. Her hair was matted, and despite the cool air outside, beads of sweat ran down her face and drenched her white blouse. Bending over to rest her head on the woman's chest, she felt a heartbeat, slow and breathing even slower. Looking over the woman whose raspy breaths and tightly closed eyes conveyed nothing but the worst, she tried to get reins on what was wrong with her. She could see several areas where the skin was red and swollen. In an especially bad spot, a small dark line protruded out. I got you. Muriel lifted quickly and rushed through the house. She could hear the horse whining outside as she rummaged through every cupboard and cabinet, eventually making her way into what looked like the woman's bedroom. The nightstand slid open, and there it was. Muriel's tunnel vision returned. Carrying herself back to the old woman, she knelt, placed the EpiPen on her skin, and pressed the plunger down. With the pen empty, her hands rested on the woman's chest, and like she was taught, in smooth rhythm, compressed. She was reminded of the horse breathing, the clicking of its hooves, the whipping of the wind. All of it meshed into that pattern. She thought back to her mother. She was too late to save her, but not this time. Come on, come on, please, she repeated to herself. Then a cold, frail hand wrapped around her wrist. She was worried she'd be face to face with one of those golden-eyed things. Instead, she saw a quizzical look from the elderly woman. Who the hell are you? The old woman managed to rasp out, her words still saturated with effort. Muriel wasn't able to reply at first. She could only laugh, relief emptying all her sorrows and doubts. She didn't have to make a difference in the world, just with one person at a time. I'm so sorry. I'm Muriel. She looked back at the open doorway, expecting to see the steed still trotting around. Your horse helped get me here. He saved you, she continued, trying to get sight of the hero. It was the old woman's turn to laugh, though hers was mixed with phlegmy coughs that cleared the mucus stuck in her throat. Oh, laddie, I don't own a horse. Why don't you use my phone to call for help? And I'll tell you a story while we wait. The two exchanged a look. Normally, Muriel would have fought it, but it was now far from the weirdest thing she had seen that day. And as her fingers fidgeted with the old landline telephone, she could see the faint smear of the crushed blackberry staining her palm, the ones that had been rubbed raw by the horse's reins. You're not going to believe this one, Dad, she whispered to herself, quickly licking up the smudge on her hand. She expected it to be bitter, but it couldn't have been sweeter.
Thank you for listening to Freaky Folklore, the podcast about mankind's horrifying legends and myths. Don't forget to follow Freaky Folklore on Spotify and iTunes. If you can, leave the show an honest review on iTunes to help us grow. Freaky Folklore is part of the EerieCast Podcast Network, the home for listeners who love to feel scared. Go to EerieCast.com to find other terrifying podcasts, such as Tales from the Break Room and Redwood Bureau. If you would like to submit an encounter or suggestions for future episodes, you can email them to carmencarrion at gmail.com. That is C-A-R-M-A-N C-A-R-R-I-O-N at gmail.com You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram for information on future episodes. Until next time, stay safe out there because this world is a strange one. <laughs>